Welcome everybody to the third E.M. Ramsey Center seminar uh, this term. Uh, tonight we'll hear, oops, I did something that I shouldn't have done. Okay. Uh, tonight we'll hear Dr. Nicholas Saunders speaking about uh, divine action and more than science. Um, Dr. Saunders studied physics and uh, theology. He obtained a doctorate on the relationship between the two disciplines and also worked at CERN developing particle detectors for using the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, you might have heard of that last year quite a bit. Um, he has many publications on the relationship between science and theology, including a monograph on the subject of divine action and more than science, published by Cambridge University Press. And uh, since leaving academia, he has become a barrister at Brick Court Chambers, but continues to work on the interface between science and theology when time allows him. So welcome. Uh, with me, Dr. Nicholas Sanders. Thanks very much. Um, I, I was going to give an overview of um, the relationship between divine action and science, but I'm very happy to, to talk about any areas in more detail at, at the end. But we'll sort of this is a bit of a canter through what, quite a lot of different issues that, that come up in this area. Um, just to begin, one, one of the most remarkable features of mathematics is its ability to apply to empirical science. Um, we seem to have very little difficulty in applying mathematics to the world, and yet the precise role it performs in its various applications is surprisingly elusive. Um, Wigner once remarked that the miracle of the appropriateness of mathematics for formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift that we neither understand nor deserve. <laughs> And there are similar points that have been made by a number of other physicists outside the context of religion. Uh, Steven Weinberg, for example, commented on the fact that it's very strange that mathematicians are led by a sense of mathematical beauty to develop formal structures that physicists only later find useful. That, he comments, often occurs when the mathematician had no such goal in mind. Physicists generally find the ability of mathem mathematicians to anticipate the mathematics needed in theories of physics quite uncanny. But, of course, Weinberg's comment and, and Wigner's comment begs a wider question. What is the extent to which pure mathematics, or perhaps more accurately, the availability of certain mathematical tools, um, properly shapes and skews our understanding of God's creation? Absent the mathematical tools to perform physics, we'd have a great deal of difficulty making any predictions about the physical world at all. Now, some of the issues raised by mathematics are not much discussed under the... Um, uh, 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 heading of philosophy of mathematics, and they've not really been the subject of much discussion in the science and theology arena either, um, despite the fact that actually they underpin quite a lot of debates that are happening in, in science and theology more generally. Um, there are at least three high-level questions that, that, um, that mathematics raises that have important ramifications for theology. Firstly, essentiality. I is mathematics really essential to physics, can we, can we do physics and can we understand the, the natural world without mathematics? Um, what has more ontological priority in the world? Is, is it the physics or the methods that you use to do the physics? Is there some kind of psychological or any other kind of synergy that leads to, to Weinberg's observation that, that pure abstract mathematics mysteriously predicts applied physics? Um, how, how, what, is, what is the relationship between um, maths and physics and the way that we describe the world? Secondly, there's the question of engagement. How is it that mathematics really engages with the ontology of the world? Does mathematics describe what is really out there? Does it represent nature or does it describe nature? To what extent is there a domain of applicability in mathematics? Um, and where, do those, where does that applicability break down? Are there limits to the extent that a mathematical model can, can, can properly uh, model nature? So again, this raises quite fundamental questions about the laws of nature, uh, and in particular whether they're prescriptive or descriptive of the world around them. Uh, and these are, these are issues that we're going to look at a little bit later on in, in, in the context of some of the work that's been done on divine action. And then finally, there's a third question about the ontological status of mathematics. Are the, obje the objects that mathematics dreams up, are they, are they real or do they have some other more limited status? Um, does, does the space-time theory of relativity actually have an ontological status or is it in some way a description? 
what's going on when the mathematics of quantum theory tell you that Schrodinger's cat is both dead and alive at the same time. Um, so these are all sort of wider ontological questions that, that flow out of maths. Now, the third question, what is the ontological status of mathematics, is probably the most interesting from a theological perspective, and it's the one I'm going to look at in more detail uh, as we go through this, this talk. Um, when, when Maxwell first introduced his theory of classical electrodynamics, his electrodynamic field was considered by many to be simply a mathematical <coughs> artefact, um, which with no real ontological existence at all. Um, and his, his theory related to charged particles, which were considered real, um, but not the underlying vector field. Um, the following argument led to things being seen the other way. Imagine a system of two separate charged particles. If one's agitated, then the other jiggles at a later point in time. The action isn't simultaneous. Um, when the first one is agitated, all the kinetic energy is to be found in the first particle. When the second one jiggles, all of the kinetic energy is to be found in the second particle. But that's not the case in the time in between the first one moving and the second one moving. So the energy must be conserved, and it's to be found somewhere. And, and the answer is that it must be within that vector field. So the argument goes that the field itself must, in some sense, be physically real. Um, so though it started life as a mathematical vector field in the theory, um, it soon started to, to be found that there were claims for the ontological status of that field as a physical artefact. And we find similar arguments happening in, in quantum mechanics, and, and we'll come on to those later on. Now, so why start looking at some of these foundational issues in relation to mathematics on a talk in, in divine action? Well, one of the things we'll see in a moment is that much of the contemporary discussion of divine action is really about, on the questions it has at its core, are what is the ontological status of mathematics? What is the ontological status of some of these um, that some of the theories and some of the precepts that are developed in, in mathematics and how can those be related to an assertion in many cases that, that God acts in the world. Um, before we get on to some of the sort of contemporary work between, on, on science and theology, um, it's useful just to um, start by some sort of basic definitions. What do we mean by divine action? Um, Michael Langford has offered quite a useful contemporary um, discussion of the distinction between general divine action and special divine action. Um, although, I think in, in some ways, his account also serves to identify some of the difficulties in making this kind of categorization. Langford defines general di divine action as the government of the universe through the universal laws that control or influence nature, man and history, without the need for specific or ad hoc acts of divine will. So it's parasitic upon this notion of there being a universal law, um, and that's something we'll talk about a bit in a moment. Um, Langford argues that general divine action suggests a planner who actively watches over the universe and not simply a creation that's then created and then ignored. So this is not a universe in which, um, in which there's a creation and then um, the universe is left to run its course. Um, somebody who um, actively watches the universe and sustains it in its being. Um, yet despite the fact that he acknowledges that there's an intelligent plan lying behind creation, there's no sense in which general divine action, on Langford's account, would be seen to be a personal action or a specific action in a particular place. Um, and he's quite clear about those conceptual um, difficulties in the, in, the, in the claim that God is active in all natural processes uh, uh, at once. Um, special divine action, on the other hand, concerns the specific actions of God in creation. Um, even though in some cases the result of these actions may be the same as those of general divine action, such as, for example, bringing rain or sustaining the laws of nature in, in being, um, it's not possible, he argues, to argue to distinguish between general and special divine action solely on the basis of the phenomenon. It's, it's, um, what the approach he takes is that the root of the distinction is not the individuality of the recipient of the providential care, but the individuality of the providential act. Special providence is analogous to a human decision, and it's for this reason that's bound up with the idea of God as personal. So, in essence, his, his approach is that this, this personal nature of the action is something that makes an action a special divine action as opposed to the general action of upholding the whole of the universe in, in being. 
I think beneath that there's a more fundamental distinction, which is a slightly more scientific approach to the distinction, which is that um, special divine action um, is a, a divine action that takes place at a particular point in space and time, and general divine action is, is action which um, pertains to the whole of creation simultaneously, or is the sustaining of, of creation in, in its being and its maintenance in, in its being. Um, so, I mean, that's the, the of course, you, you can, on that very basic distinction, still have a place for special divine action that has a purpose and special divine action that's defined on the basis of this personal relationship with God. But it, purely in terms of its, um, the, the um, specificity and the locality of special divine action, I think it's a better approach just to talk about it in terms of it being the notion of divine action taking place at particular times in particular places. Uh, the one thing I haven't mentioned on this slide, of course, is relativity, but that's for, I think, another day. There's no whole discussion to be had about that. Um, so th that's the basic distinction between general divine action and special divine action. What about miracles? Um, at, at first sight, it would seem really impossible to offer a causal account of special divine action in a world in which it's claimed that all physical events in creation are governed by an inviolable set of laws. So um, the, the impossibility can only be overcome by God, the argument goes. Um, what God would do in those circumstances is to override the regularity of his creation. He, he sustains the inviolable laws in being, but chooses to override them. Um, uh, and um, this has given, given, given rise to, to what's known as invent, interventionist or self-contradictory approach to, to divine action. It's a uh, God acting in, in, on the one hand to sustain things and being on the other hand to choose to, to, um, to uh, violate those, those basic laws. Um, the, the possibility for self-contradiction comes from what, what is in effect a postulate that these inviolable laws of nature govern all events. So um, that, that they are a product of God's creation and that they're continually maintained in existence by God. Um, the obvious counterpart to that violation, as it were, miracle account of special divine action is that of divine action within nature, which is based on a, a separate approach, uh, postulate concerning the laws of nature, that they're in some way sufficiently flexible or that the laws don't provide a, a sufficiently tight tapestry that there is enough openness and flexibility within nature to accommodate divine action. And this is very much the way that, um, the, as it were, the sort of more recent work in science and theology has gone. It's been quite a quest for indeterminacy to a certain extent. It's been a, a, a looking for where the scientific account of nature is sufficiently, um, where, as it were, the building blocks don't quite fit together sufficiently clearly, or where there's indeterminacy in quantum theory or suggestions in chaos theory that there may be some, some sort of indeterminacy as well, and we'll come on to that later on. So it, there's been a lot of focus about um, looking for flexibility in nature, and that's the way that uh, much of the, um, the, the recent science and theology work on, on divine action has gone. Um, the predominant concern in, in the large literature on miracles concerns instances of special divine action that are taken to act against the laws of nature. Um, one of the first people to make this position explicit in the context of natural philosophy was John Wilkins, who was one of the founding members of the Royal Society, um, who said explicitly that a miracle was a violation or a disordering of the universal laws of nature. Now, in the debates concerning this notion of violation that have followed, there are essentially three different types of argument. There have been considerations of the value of testimony in order to establish that a particular miracle has taken place. So there are issues about how many people it would take to prove a miracle, how you go about showing that a miracle has actually happened. There have been issues about uh, discussions of the philosophical issues inherent in holding belief in um, both um, violation miracles and belief in the laws of nature at the same time, and what, whether this is something that theologically fits together. A lot of people like, for example, John Polkinghorne and Arthur Peacock have said that it's theologically undesirable to have this notion of violation miracles because it's, it's a sort of, there's an inconsistency in God's, um, it suggests there's an inconsistency in, in, in God. Um, and there are also um, attempts to reconcile belief in violation miracles with laws from 
a theological perspective. Um, now, I'm not going to spend a vast amount of time talking about miracles, but obviously you can't do this without touching on Hume. Um, the, the, the possibility of defining a miracle, um, of course, only uh, as a violation of a law of nature, only comes about when you have a well-established law of nature which you can violate. Um, and the essence of Hume's favor, uh, famous argument was that the quality of the evidence needed to establish that a particular law of nature had been violated was such that it was most unlikely that there would ever be enough detailed historical facts to establish that when considered against the huge amount of contradictory evidence for that law's existence. So it was effectively an evidential analysis. So in, in accordance with his earlier comments in the inquiry concerning human understanding, that, that you can't have weaker evidence outweighing more um, uh, stronger evidence, in effect what Hume does is to define the law of nature a law of nature and the miraculous in such a way that they remain um, mutually exclusive. So there is, in essence, the the um, the, the much of uh, many of the critics of, of Hume have, um, have have approached it on the basis that on his approach to the laws of nature, looking at the philosophy of laws of nature, it's actually impossible for there to be a miracle because the the definition, the approach that he's taken to to laws of nature philosophically is that, um, that the evidence can never outweigh the um, evidence for the law of nature existing. Now, more recently, um, the philosophy of science has sort of fallen into a number of different approaches to laws of nature. And um, it's quite important when you're looking at some of the contemporary work in science and theology to be quite clear about which different accounts which philosopher or theologian is actually using because you see hints of um, some people are occasionally have a, adopt a regularity approach other people are out and out necessitarians and so on and I'll talk a little bit about these different approaches now. The, the regularity um, uh, approach to the laws of nature um, is essentially the um, constant conjunction approach which um, is, is sort of inspired by Hume. Um, it's actually very difficult to be an out-and-out -out regularist. It's, it's so inimical to our um, modern worldview that physical laws owe their origins to some source other than the facts of the world. Uh, and um, that makes it actually quite, quite difficult to be nothing more than uh, somebody who attributes laws to the events that have taken place. Um, now, for a true regula regularist, then, the very notion of a violation miracle is actually simply illogical. Um, as one of the points made by Norman Schwartz when he was looking at, uh, at Hume's work was that Hume himself is quite inconsistent in his approach because he adopts a law-breaking definition, a conception of the miraculous, but the mere possibility, the bare logical possibility of God's performing a, a miracle is inconsistent with being a, a, the regularity approach to the laws of nature. You, can, you can't preserve a regularity account, a true regularity account, and allow that God could, although he might not, perform a miracle. So, in connection with the claim that causal um, special divine action objectively takes place, because of the ontological primacy of individual events, what happens is that the laws in, on the regularity account simply form around the events that have taken place. Your laws would cover the special divine action that has occurred. Essentially, you define the laws to, to cover the events. So, I mean, essentially, if you're a regulatarian, you can finish the talk there because there is no potential inconsistency between divine action and, and, and modern science if that's your approach to the laws of nature. Um, because your, your laws fit around whatever divine action has taken place. There are instrumentalist approach, approaches as well. Um, again, those appear to say relatively little that fundamentally conflict with an, act, an idea that God is active in the world um, in, in special divine action. Um, the basis of instrumentalist approaches are that laws exist in descriptions in rational minds. Um, and those are descriptions which the mind would impose on the external world of events. So um, the, the idea of scientific research is to categorise and organise natural observed phenomena 
uh, into the most economic and coherent set of rules that you can find. So you're trying to find the most economic set of explanations possible using your human mind, but the, the, um, the, the universe is the universe. Uh, and it's this process of ordering that, that means that the instrumentalist approach um, is primarily directed to establishing laws of science and not laws of nature. Because the laws, the origin of the laws, is to be found in the capabilities of human organisation. You're not attempting to describe ontology necessarily. What you're trying to do is come up with the most coherent set of rules that as an instrumentalist you can do to, to describe the nature that you, you observe. Now, in contrast with both of those approaches, um, the, necessari uh, the necessarian approach makes the claim that physical laws ontologically determine what um, possibilities are open to the world and which are not. So the regularities on the necessitarian approach are that um, the, uh, the, the regularities we observe in nature are manifestations of laws rather than their, um, rather than their constitution. So laws are ontologically primary and then how they're manifest is the thing that we observe through science. And it's this necessitarian approach that obviously leads to the desire to find indeterminacy. Because once you hold that, that, laws are, uh, that, that the laws of nature are ontologically primary, then you then have to go about trying to find a way, for, uh, to find a, um, a, w a way that, that um, special divine action can take place without conflicting your understanding of the laws of nature. So it's quite important to appreciate that often in, when you're reading scientists, theologians that have written about uh, the laws of nature, they, they, they often start off as necessitarians. They drift into regularity approaches when, when sometimes when it suits them, and then they sort of drift back to a necessitarian approach, and then usually with a bit of quantum philosophy thrown in. So there, there's quite a lot of different and quite subtle philosophical movements that are going on behind these behind these discussions. I think it's quite important to try and unpack those as you as you as you read these. Um, before we leave just looking at these um, the, the laws of nature and these different approaches to the laws of nature, there is one other fundamental question, which is something which um, Nancy Cartwright and some other philosophers have looked at, which is how do they fit together? Is it true that there is a universal coverage of the laws of nature, even if you are a necessitarian, are there some laws that only have certain domains of applicability? Are there, um, do, do all laws fit together or do they have gaps? Um, essentially, is there, I think uh, Cartwright uses this notion as a patchwork of laws. You don't have a, a, a universal coverage of, of natural laws. So um, it, it's, it, th this, um, again, much of the assumption is not only that you're proceeding as a necessitarian, but you're doing it assuming that laws are truly universal and that out there, even though you may not have discovered them or may not have done the experiments, there are other universal necessitarian laws. So in a way, a lot of scientists and theologians are setting up the highest hurdle for themselves philosophically before they then approach the question of how could God act in the world. And that's why you'll see the, the recourse to indeterminism. Now, what, what is indeterminism and, and determinism? Um, there's a, a very good book by John Ehrman called A, a Primer on Determinism, which is, if, if, you, if you want to read a little bit more about determinism, that is absolutely the best, best starting point. But one of, the, um, uh, one of the points that Ehrman makes is that Newtonian mechanics, unless you set very tight boundary conditions, is not actually a deterministic, um, uh, deterministic system because of what Ehrman terms space invaders things can come in and causally alter things in Newtonian mechanics without the system being fully deterministic. So it's all about how you set the boundary conditions on a system that actually determine whether something is in fact deterministic or not. Um, William James, um, I think, gives one of the best sort of feels for, for what, what um, determinism is. Um, determinism professes that those parts of the universe already laid down absolutely point and decree what the other parts shall be. The future has no ambiguous possibilities hidden in its womb. The part we call the present is compatible with only one totality. Any other future complement than the one fixed from eternity is impossible. The whole is in each and every part and welds it to an absolute unity, an iron block in which there can be no equivocation or shadow of turning. 
Indeterminism, on the contrary, says that the parts have a certain amount of loose play on one another, so that the laying down of one of them does not necessarily determine what the others shall be. Now, obviously, this is a 19th century account, and we know a bit more about iron blocks than, than uh, William James did, but um, as a... As a uh, as a, as a description of the, the difference between a deterministic system and an indeterministic system, this is quite a, quite a helpful um, description. So, why do scientists, theologians, like indeterminism? Well, if you're an asceticarian and you think that the, the laws of nature ont uh, exist ontologically and prescribe the events that happen, then potentially the, the, the laws of nature are such that unless there is this free play, the, 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 or they don't fit together precisely, then you create a system in which they are sustained by general divine action, but there's very little place for God to act in a special, in, in, in particular places and times through special divine action. So in a way, it, it is God's sustaining of those laws of nature that is precisely the reason why, um, on the necessitarian account, why God can't also act in particular times and places. So indeterminism potentially seems very attractive. It looks quite loose. There's a certain amount of interplay. God could make certain changes in different places in order to act at different times and places, and laws of science would be unaffected because they are fundamentally indeterministic. That's the, um, that's the approach. Um, the, there is a difficulty with this, uh, and it's one that hasn't really been developed very fully in, 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 the, in the literature. Um, it's a central presupposition of all the arguments for the action of God in these irreducibly statistical processes that God can some, in some way see behind the indeterminism. So um, he, he has to be able to see behind it and somehow manipulate it and, and control it. Um, but the theologian is unfortunately left with a sticky problem. How is it that God can be active without overruling that indeterminism, if it truly is ontologically indeterminate? Um, it, it, God is sustaining it with, with one hand uh, and, and fixing it, fiddling with it with the other. Um, and David Bartholomew is um, one of the few people who has written about this, and, and only briefly in one of his books, but he makes the... Makes the um, I think quite important comment that I find it impossible to frame any statement about God's action in generating random events which avoids the notion of design on his part and so justifies us in saying that chance events are without any explanation whatsoever. To allow the existence of pure chance, ontological indeterminism is, is rather like saying God can choose to act so his left hand doesn't know what his right is doing. Um, or to put it more formally, there must be sources of independent action within the one Godhead. Now, I put it slightly differently to that, but to the extent that something is truly ontologically indeterminate and is sustained in being by God, there must be some act of divine kenosis, a withholding of God's knowledge about the indeterminate thing, because otherwise it wouldn't be truly indeterminate. It must be maintained in an indeterminate state. And then you have a difficult time uh, reconciling how uh, Einstein spoke about quantum mechanics and said he hated that um, does God play dice? Well, God isn't playing dice. God is cheating at playing dice, effectively, because not only does he sustain it, but he's also um, acting through determining certain indeterminacies. So there is a underlying a lot of the appeals to indeterminism. There is this fundamental tension that, that's, um, again, surprisingly un, unarticulated in the literature and hasn't really been, I think, to a certain extent, thought through. Um, we'll talk briefly about um, quantum mechanics. Um, obviously, the quantum mechanics in itself is a, is a huge area. Um, the real appeal of quantum mechanics for science and theology has been the fact that, um, at least on the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, at the point of measurement, there is posited to be this indeterminism. You don't know which of the different states are selected. But the problem is there are a number of different interpretations of quantum mechanics. And there's a whole industry of quantum metaphysics out there with different people arguing for different interpretations. Um, one, of the, one of the different interpretations is instead of the um, 
uh, Eugene Wigner, which is actually in many ways the most mathematically simple one, instead of having a, a, a collapse of the wave function that leads to indeterminism at the point of measurement, the whole universe just evolves separately and you have, a, as it were, a split in the universe and you end up with these many worlds of, of, of different, um, in which different possibilities occur at every, every um, measurement. Now, obviously, that leads, leads to an enormous number of um, duplicate worlds out there, but um, mathematically, that's in, in, in many ways a much simpler approach to the Copenhagen interpretation. One of the interesting things about the relationship between th theology and quantum mechanics is actually there, when you're looking at these very metaphysical issues about which, which interpretation of quantum mechanics is more attractive than the other, theology can have something to, to input to that. I mean, it, it's a many worlds which are all sustained by God um, is a very unattractive world because although it's difficult to imagine quantum mechanical measurements being good or evil, as it were, there will be worlds in which some very nasty things happen, there will be worlds in which some very good things happen. And to imagine all of that being sustained simultaneously by God is quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting notion. It does, this is one area where perhaps if, if, you, if you're a, 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 you know, an ambitious theologian, it's an area where you can start, you can look at the, some of the philosophical consequences from a theological viewpoint and that can help guide how you're doing your quantum metaphysics. Because some of these approaches are much less attractive theologically than others. Um, another approach to quantum mechanics is the pilot wave interpretation. That's um, due to uh, de, Lou de Broglie and, and um, Bohm. Um, now, again, that, that has an extra equation. It's not as straightforward as, as uh, the, the um, Copenhagen interpretation, but it works perfectly well. It's fully accurate. It's just very unpopular. Now, you know, again, why uh, there's some interesting literature around why is it that scientists tend to, if you ask the average physicist, they tend to go for the Copenhagen interpretation and this notion of indeterminacy. But it's not necessary. There are inter interpretations of quantum mechanics which are not indeterministic. There's no... Um, they don't have this indeterminism built in. So there are lots of different issues around lurking around quantum mechanics, um, and if your your appeal to indeterminism for the purposes of divine action is actually really looking at just the measurement phenomena within the Copenhagen interpretation, if you're an necessitarian and you're, you're um, convinced that the laws of nature form a, a perfect patchwork. So again, we're dealing with quite a, a series of quite important metaphysical decisions even before you get to, to look, at, look at this literature. But this was, uh, I mean, certainly sort of seven or eight years ago, was very much in vogue in the science and theology community. I think it's gone slightly, become slightly less fashionable now, but um, you know, there are, it still has a number of strong proponents. So that's um, quantum mechanics. Um, what about chaos theory? I don't know whether they've, do they come out very clearly? It um, doesn't matter. But the chaos theory, um, th there are, um, according to one fairly recent review, over 9,000 papers on chaos theory. Now, chaos theory isn't really anything to do with chaos, and in, I think to a certain extent it's not really a theory either. Um, it isn't anything to do with the absence of order, um, and it's not, it doesn't involve additional postulates about how nature operates. It's quite different from quantum mechanics in that regard. So um, you don't postulate that there's an indeterminacy in quantum mechanics. Chaos theory is really a consequence of classical physics. It, it, it's, it, it's something that we've learnt, uh, as, as you'll see in a moment, through having the ability to, to, to um, do more and more computation. And, and um, it then became apparent that some systems, non-linear systems, were far more um, sensitive to their initial conditions than we'd, than, than we'd originally thought. So it's not about something being chaotic in the sense of being disordered. It's about the consequences of deterministic ma mathematics in discrete systems. So what's all the fuss? Well, chaos theory has shown that there are two different phenomena. This, this, this first of those is, called, is known as sensitive dependence on initial conditions. This is the um, so-called butterfly effect, which I'll talk about in a second. And the other thing is that the, this notion of strange attractors, which you get a little bit, and fractals in, 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 that arise in chaos theory too. Now, um, Edward Lorentz was um, at the forefront of identifying these problems somewhat by accident in the 1960s. What he did was he looked at um, 
some uh, equations known as the Navier-Stokes equations that are to do with viscous fluid flow. Um, and they, they are a series of equations, but they don't have a, a general um, solution. So he thought, well, I'll stick them into an early computer and I'll try and solve them that way. Um, so he came up with those equations on the screen there, which I'm afraid aren't terribly clear. But um, x is the it, proportional to the intensity of the convection. Y is the temperature proportional to the temperature difference between ascending and descending currents of air. And Z is a, a representation of the change in the temperature profile of the air. And so he came up with these three equations. Um, the rate of the change of each of the variables is dependent on the other two, so they're interconnected three equations. And he ran them through a um, computer, 1960s computer at MIT. The machine, as the story goes at least, calculated the various parameters in the equations to six decimal places. Um, and once his program had run, he printed out the results, but only to three decimal places, because he wanted to save on paper. Um, one day, he put the, the data from the printout back into the computer to, to look back at some interesting phenomena he'd seen. However, what he found was that the difference between the computer's internal accuracy and that of the data he'd printed out led to a huge difference in the, in the data as, the, um, as, the, as he ran the model. And those are his, his results taken from uh, a Stuart book. You'll see that they start, both graphs start very similarly, and then the differences become more and more manifest. And th then, towards the end, the graphs are actually very, very different indeed. And that's the very small difference in the three additional decimal places being manifest over time. Um, what he famously concluded when he uh, printed out his results was this. Two states differing by imperceptible amounts may eventually evolve into two considerably different states. If then there is any error whatsoever in observing the present state, and in any such system and such errors seem inevitable, an acceptable prediction of an instantaneous state in the distant future may well be impossible. Now, I suspect this is about the most depressing thing that a meteorologist could have written. Uh, effectively, it suggested that his colleagues might as well pack up and go and look for another job. Um, and in fact, his equations are so sensitive that if you want to be able to predict something as simple as whether a particular air current is convecting in a clockwise or anti-clockwise way, after 100 seconds, you need to know the initial position of the air molecules to approximately 40 decimal places. So that's the level of sensitivity. And as you can see, I, I, it must have been a profoundly depressing few weeks. Um, so this, this, this notion of sensitive dependence on initial conditions is um, something that's been widely captured by the media and, and so on. It's often called the butterfly effect, the idea that a flap of the wings in Argentina or wherever, uh, wherever else influences the weather in the UK and Somerset levels are, are filling up. Every time you sneeze, the analogy goes, you affect the weather in China and so on. Um, Lorentz originally used a seagull, which is rather less prosaic than a butterfly, but obviously over time this, um, this developed. Now, the problem about sensitive dependence on initial conditions is that when you're actually studying chaos theory, it, it makes it very, very difficult to actually analyze it using a computer. Because as soon as you think that you're following a particular trajectory in, in the equation, what your computer, which will only work to a certain level of accuracy, immediately starts to head off and start plotting other, other trajectories in that equation because of the errors that are building up through the, the level of whatever level of accuracy even our modern computers have. So in, what, in effect, what you're doing is you're following paths by plotting a Lorentz equation. What you're doing is plotting intervals in different paths of the equation depend, on the assumption of different initial states. So you get a, a on average, you get a, a, a as it were, a, 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 a sort of gross um, uh, image of, of how the Lorentz equations might, uh, might, might work, but you're not actually following individual particles over time. It's actually very difficult, it's effectively meaningless to say you're following the trajectory of a particular particle over time as it, as it evolves, because you're combining, you're plotting a lot of different possible trajectories because of your um, error. So the computer modeling doesn't really give us um, the trajectory of a particle, but when you plot the Lorentz equations, you get something like that. And that's a, a 3D graph, which um, 
there's a depth to it as well. But the thing you see is that there are, there are two areas where, as it were, the, the, the rings are closing in on each other. And it's a bit, um, if you imagine a, a, having it swinging a pendulum, the pendulum over time um, will decelerate uh, through air resistance and whatever else until eventually it steadies on a particular point. And if you plot it over time, the movements, the, the, the um, disruption gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it, 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 it centers on an area. And in the Lorentz equation here, you've got, there are two of these areas, and these are known as chaotic attractors. So they're, they're regions in which um, effectively the trajectories are, are narrowing in and getting closer and closer together. Um, now, chaotic systems are deterministic um, because they're based on Newtonian mechanics in a bounded system. So for any particular set of initial conditions, if you knew them in sufficient detail, you would, in theory, be able to p predict the trajectory using the maths. Um, now, um, what, although um, you can't predict um, you can't predict how the equations, um, uh, uh, how, you can't predict a result for the same reasons that Lorentz, um, Lorentz uh, identified. That places a big epistemological limit on what you can know about a chaotic system, which one with sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Um, but ontologically, the, if the laws of nature are universal and uh, you're approaching them as a necessi necessitarian, they are still there is still an ontologically deterministic theory underlying this. It's just that our ability to, to see it is very limited. Now, these attractors, which we've got here in the, the Lorentz equation, have what, what is known as a fractal structure. And um, they're, they're what, um, the, the, that term was coined by um, a, a mathematician called Benoit Mandelbrot. Um, what they are are areas of infinite complexity which as you approach the limit, as it were, the point where the pendulum stops moving, the, um, and in here where the, um, where the, where the trajectories um, enter into the attractor, the energy differences between those different paths get vanishingly small. They become infinitesimally small. And this is why the appeal to chaos theory has become interesting from a divine action perspective. And John Polkinghorn, in particular, has looked at um, whether it's possible for God to act um, through what he terms information input. So where in the deep inside the chaotic attractor, where the energy levels between these different trajectories are incredibly small, or infinitesimally small, God could act by not actually performing an energetic act, he could perform, just act by um, providing information, effectively, to select between different trajectories. This is, this is um, the approach that John's taken. Now, John's, th this is really part of Polkinghorne's work on reductionism more generally. Um, what Polkinghorne is, is doing is talking about, as it were, downward and upward emergence at the same time. So he isn't saying that um, the deterministic phenomena of chaos theory are, are ones that, that somehow lead to some kind of indeterminism. It's actually a, a, a more uh, general postulate about the way that the universe is, is, is constructed. If you have phenomena in which you live in a world of clouds and um, rather than clocks, you live in a world where there appear to be these, these opennesses and, and um, chaos theory is, is, is one potential, uh, as it were, a sort of diagnostic of them, then Polkinghorne postulates that actually there may be indeterminacy at different levels within explanation. So this is a very fundamental assertion about indeterminism generally, not, which is, as it were, uh, uh, prompted by the, the phenomena of chaos theory. But it's not a, a simplistic uh, assertion that because, in some way, the, the, the mathematics leads to epistemological uncertainty, that, that actually the universe is actually indeterministic. It's a, a more fundamental assertion that he's made than that. Now, um, the, the fractals from that. Fractals um, have um, the same degree of irregularity on all scales. So this is uh, Mandelbrot's uh, famous description. A fractal object looks the same when examined far away or nearby. It's self-similar. But Mandelbrot goes further and says, well, look at nature. 
There are many things in nature that have this sort of interesting structure where small units repeat, and that's something that we see when we, when we look at some of these nonlinear systems. You see cauliflowers, I don't know if you've ever seen that a particular type of cauliflower, where the, I can't remember what it's called, where there's a like slightly triangular profile to it, and it's, it's a quite beautiful thing. Ferns as well, each, each as it were, a prong on the fern is a replica of the shape of the fern itself and so on. Broccoli. Um, each branch and twig is like the whole, says, says Mandelbrot. And there's the famous Mandelbrot set in which you can zoom in infinitesimally and you keep on zooming in. This was a big thing in the 80s. You keep on zooming in and then you find another replica of this at a deeper level and so on. It's going to spend many thrilling afternoons going through this. Now, on, on Polkinghorne's approach to, to chaos theory, God's not an interfering agent in some way in the same sense as to other agents, because that would imply some kind of energy input. But um, he, he suggests that there is a way that God could influence creation deep inside these chaotic attractors in a non-energetic um, non way, this input of information. Um, the difficulty is that nature, although chaos theory, some, some systems are non-linear and you get um, chaotic, uh, chaos theory can, can be used to, to uh, talk about bulk behaviours and you get some things which behave, uh, as it were, in inverted commas, chaotically. Nature is not infinitely complex. Um, and you don't get these, these uh, infinite, uh, infinite levels of, um, infinite levels of um, complexity and infinitely small differences in energy levels. And that's, um, you can look, for example, at a, a well-known reaction called the belazov sabotinsky reaction. This is a, 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 a non-linear chemical oscillator. Very, I'll show you it in a minute. Um, what, what happens is you have two different um, uh, processes running on at the same time. One, one generates uh, molecular bromine, which gives a nice red color. The other one eats up the bromine uh, and um, produces ions, so it disappears. You get a very nice effect, which we'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, no one knows the quite the full um, uh, the, the intermediate steps. They're thought to be about 18, and you um, that that's the, the as it were the sort of the the, the um, gross high level equation. You start with the uh, malonic acids and, and 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 add some bromate ions, and then you get bromate and some carbon dioxide and some water as well. Now um, this is a video by um, someone called Tim Kench. Let me see if I can get that to work. Yep, here we are. This is the, the actual reaction. So there you see the series of concentric circles being formed as the ions and the bromine and, and ions are being formed. Uh, and the, the reaction is actually autocatalytic as well. So um, it, as things are created, they then get changed from one state to another. I presume carbon dioxide is being blown off all the time. So you, and you get this very pleasant, pleasant effect. Now, Nice, you can model that very nicely. I mean, obviously not the exact, exactly what's happened in that dish, but you can model it very nicely using quite simple mathematics. And it is a, a non-linear chaotic system. Um, but it doesn't mean that there is this infinite complexity because in that Petri dish at any one particular time, there will only be a certain number of bromine atoms and a certain number of, um, certain number of ions. Um, it isn't, or even though the mathematics that you use to do it has a series of, um, has a series of, um, I'll just put that back on, um, has a, has a, has a uh, as, as part of it, has a necessary consequence that there are fractal attractors. So what you're, you get in uh, when you're dealing with chaos theory is you have a very unusual situation in science. Often you tend to make simplifying assumptions as a physicist. You assume that that, um, that, that things are perfectly spherical, you imagine that collisions are perfectly elastic, that strings never stretch, that ladders never bend, and, and so on. But chaos theory and, and nonlinear mathematics, when you do it, tends to make complexifying assumptions. It assumes that nature has this fractal structure and that there are these, um, that, that there are these um, interesting uh, fractal attractors. And that's, that's why it is, I mean, the fact that these fractal attractors are very unlikely to exist in, in nature, especially in a system like the belisov sabotinsky reaction, where there couldn't be an infinite complexity to it, because in that dish, at any one time, there are only a finite number of atoms. Um, that leads to a quite an interesting issue about how that particular mathematical model 
actually how, the, the, how far the domain of applicability of that model goes. It would appear that when we're dealing with nonlinear models, um, it's fine to talk about them at a gross level, but when you get into um, some of the, uh, these issues around um, infinite complexity, infinite complexity um, the, the model breaks down. It's no longer a realistic model. And that's, I think, the, one of the problems with appeals to chaos theory from a divine action perspective. Insofar as there's information input, it would need to happen at an area, as it were, deep inside the fractal attractor, where there is no information, no energetic difference between these, these different states. And you just don't get that, even though chaos theory is in some way modeling this. So it's a very interesting area which raises some very fundamental questions about the status of mathematics in, in describing the world. And as, as I said at the beginning, it's really a lot of this discussion is, is fundamentally about what is, how good at all is mathematics at modeling the universe. And that's really where we get to with, with much of the debate about divine action. Uh, Peter Smith, um, in a very good book about chaos theory, um, summarised the position as this. Given a merely surface descriptive appeal to fractals, where it's claimed that some natural phenomenon has a fractal-like look to it, we can agree that there may well be similar measurement behaviour at coarse scales. But we really should be cautious about leaping to assert that some department of nature really has a fractal geometry. We always need to ask, won't a better surface description of nature in fact be provided by pre-fractals that lack the infinite detail? To which the answer seems invariably yes. So again, it, it, there is a... Some of the consequences of, of modelling these nonlinear systems are ones which are obviously cannot be realistic. They cannot describe ontology of nature. And that, that's why, again, it, it's very interesting generally, but particularly for um, some of these approaches to divine action. I'll just talk very briefly about other possible approaches, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, so what do we do if we don't like quantum theory and we don't like chaos theory? Um, well, there are some other potential approaches to divine action. There are um, notions of a patchwork of natural laws that I mentioned earlier on. Do laws have, or do laws that only have a limited domain of applicability? Um, quantum theory obviously works very well at uh, very small scales, but doesn't work at large scales. Um, chaos theory and um, nonlinear uh, mathematics generally seems to work quite well when you're dealing with bulk phenomena, but you, the fractal nature of it seems extremely unrealistic. And so it may be that a lot of our understanding of nature, even if you're an necessitarian, you believe that the laws of nature actually determine things, those laws only have limited applicability. And if that's right, then this problem of worrying about the extent to which divine action has to fit in an indeterministic system, or worrying about the extent to which the divine action has to as well, fit between the gaps between theories, um, may be something that we've sort of worked up for ourselves. I think it may not be such a critical problem as, as many people um, worry about. Divine action, another possibility is this notion of different ontological levels of description. This is something which uh, John Polkinghorne's uh, work on chaos theory is, is about. If, if things seem to be a particular way as a result of our study of them, then is it possible that there could be um, uh, uh, indeterminism, uh, as it were, at a low down level, but not at a gross level? There may be indeterminism at a higher level and, and so on. And this is really uh, sort of tied in with this notion of emergence and causation, which is another whole enormous area. And then um, an area which um, Arthur Peacock was very keen on, which is the whole part causation. So can the whole act in a way that, that, that causes actions on, it, on its parts? So these are some other, as it were, sort of less, less theory-specific approaches to, to divine action, which uh, I think, in my view, is I think they're more promising than, than going down the chaos route or the, the quantum route. Um, but the, the, both of those still have very vocal proponents. Uh, it is, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting area in the sense that, that, that um, things are, uh, th these debates are quite held very passionately by their, by their various um, proponents. Um, how far can we ever get with any of this? Well, to wrap up, William Sherlock, who was a 17th century Dean of St. Paul's, put it quite nicely, the methods of divine wisdom are infinite and unsearchable. We must not expect fully to comprehend all the secrets and mysteries of God's government but something we may know of this, enough to teach us to reverence God and to trust in him and to vindicate our comprehension of his providence from the cavils of ignorance and infidelity, which is as much as it's useful for us to know. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Nick. That was really interesting. Um, there is some time for questions. Um, I'm sure there will be some going out. Um, if not, I'll certainly we'll have some. Okay. <laughs> I'll be passing around the microphone, um, so um, just wait until the microphone comes to you. Thanks. Um, I'd like to come back, if we may, to the concept of God's kenosis. Mm. Um, I heard a very interesting talk about quantum mechanics and theological terminology by a chap called Stoyan Tanev about a few months ago. And as far as I recall, he used the, or he thought there was a role for the, what we would call in theology, the apathetic approach, that is, as God being completely inconceivable, indescribable. Um, the terminology used in that kind of theology to describe quantum mechanics, which itself um, becomes undescribable after a certain state. And he used a very kind of poetic example of Niels Bohr, who used to almost stutter and slow down and have problem in his delivery. And people thought he had some kind of speech impediment, but really all he was doing was struggling to find words in the English language that would be remotely adequate um, to describe the phenomenon that he was trying to put across to his audience. Um, so I guess the, the point is this in, in God's kenosis. Is there any <coughs> issue in God um, withholding either voluntarily or perhaps um, through God's non-omnipotence, if one could put it that way? Um, because in a way that, as certain contemporary theologians might put, gives man a role here to try to fill in those gaps in some form or another. Sorry, there's a number of no, questions. No, no, I, I suppose, starting with the scientific mm. point, um, I mean, I have to say I find modern quantum mechanics is an enormously successful theory. I mean, it may, enables you to make amazing predictions, but philosophically it is profoundly unsatisfactory. I mean, it, which bores the um, difficulty describing it is something which everybody, whenever, you know, when you're teaching it to undergraduates, they scratch their heads for a long time mm. about how, how one goes about sort of what is it, this, where does this indeterminacy come from and so on. So there is, I mean, I think inevitably something wrong with the way that, that certainly the, the Copenhagen interpretation, nobody at the time was particularly satisfied with it, um, hence all of the problems and, and, and um, discussions at the various conferences. Um, so, you know, it isn't, it isn't surprising that, that um, there's this problem. Um, kenosis, on the other hand, I mean, is in a way, I think, I think probably the, mo the easiest way of describing this withholding of knowledge in the mm. sense that if something is truly ontologically indeterminate, then is that if it has an actual status as being indeterminate, indeterminate to God, then it has to be sustained in, in some way. So um, it is, it, it's, I think that's the, 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 as it were, the sort of easiest terminology. But um, yeah, I mean, it, again, we are, as it were, Sherlock is, we are trying the best we can to, yes. to, to, uh, to, to, to sort of uh, vindicate our comprehension of his providence, as it were, but it's, it's, we're, in, we're in areas where I'm afraid it's pure metaphysics, really. It's Indeed. very easy to speculate one way or another. <laughs> so we're combining two metaphysical things. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, there's something that's bothering me about the, this idea that indeterminacy is a state of sort of not knowing about what it is. Um, isn't indeterminacy a state of being vague? And so the only way in which it can truly be known is in a sort of a general vague kind of way. It, it depends what you, I mean, it possibly... Even if but, you're a god. It, but, but what do you mean by vagueness? I think that's the, the question. If, if something, there's vague because epistemologically I don't know something... Um, you know, my ability to predict the weather is vague because I will never know the initial conditions with sufficient accuracy to be able to perform the prediction accurately. But that doesn't mean that there's an indeterminacy there. Um, I mean, if, 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 yeah. if by vague you mean it's profoundly vague in the sense that no that's, one could ever right. know it, then um, yes, I mean, I think I agree. It's, I mean, it depends how you're, it depends what you mean by the term vague, I think. Um, I, I asked the same question to uh, Professor John Pokinghorn when he came several years ago to give a lecture like this. Uh, so oh. I put the same question to you. Oh dear. Okay, yes. 
I raised the possibility of uh, combining uh, quantum mechanics with chaos theory mm. to afford some degree of, of freedom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but his quick reaction was, because perhaps there's no time to explain this, his quick reaction was that there was no scale in chaos theory. I, don't, I didn't know what he meant by that. No but scale? No scale. I think it's very I, quick. I mean, because there, there, is, are, uh, there are people there, queuing up to see him, so he just give me a one sen okay. sentence. Uh, There's no scale, and I think what he, I don't know. I mean, there are certainly there, there have been some some theologians have talked about well, if if there is sensitive dependence on initial conditions in um, in chaos theory, um, and quantum things happen to be very small, yeah, and there's indeterminacy. So if God determined something that would be otherwise indeterminate then would that be the flap of the butterfly's wing that would then have a big yeah. deterministic effect that yeah. God could then, as it were, predict? Yeah. Um, I think probably John's comment was essentially that quantum chaos as a, as a phenomena is something which is, is notorious, I mean, it's extremely difficult to study because you, the, the quantum mechanics does not s scale to the macroscopic in an easy, easy way. You can... You can um, you're, you're dealing with sort of individual measurements in the Copenhagen interpretation. I think that's probably what he was, what he was saying. But I have to say, I mean, I, I, I'm not a, personally. I, I don't. I'm not terribly convinced by the quantum approaches myself because I, I don't. There is no. Um, I, I don't find the, um, the 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 Copenhagen approach to be a particularly intellectually satisfying approach because you know it, it just seems to be a. Uh, effectively a postulate about maybe, indeterminacy. Maybe we need a, another interpretation well, of yes. quantum mechanics so that it can work with chaos theory. Well, yeah, absolutely. There's a Nobel Prize in it for you if you can... <laughs> think if you we can, can, we can talk about it afterwards. <laughs> so I want to thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. And um, going back to Einstein, who was, uns as you mentioned, unsatisfied with quantum mechanics. And later in his life, he searched for a more fundamental theory of nature. Does this have any relationship with the approaches discussed in your talk? Um, I think, well, I don't, I'm no expert on Einstein's, so I know that he was very, it found quantum mechanics to be very un, uh, unsatisfactory. I mean, his famous comments, God does not play dice. He didn't like the Copenhagen interpretation. There were very um, enormous arguments between him and, and the other um, people in the Copenhagen school. Um, but I think that the... Um, I don't know quite where he ended up in his, in his later life, but I think that he... Um, you know, I mean, one of the things that he, he found very unsatisfactory is this notion that underlying all of this was effectively this sort of process of roulette. And um, there isn't, that isn't a necessary approach to quantum mechanics. The De Broglie-Bohm pilot wave approach does, is not, doesn't require that, that assertion that, that um, quantum mechanics is indeterminate. What it is, is it's a bulkier theory. You have to add extra equations in. And some people say it's a very contrived theory because it works, starts with the Schrodinger equation which isn't really part of the theory to begin with. Um, that's been certainly Polkinghorne's objection to De Broglie-Bohm. It's a sort of contrived bolt together of different theories, which is a bit unsatisfactory. It doesn't look right as a physicist. Um, but again, you know, what you're appealing to these notions of mathematical beauty and what makes a theory a good theory, which is actually some of the fundamental questions about mathematics. Why is mathematics so good at modelling the world? And I think those are the sorts of things that Einstein was getting quite worried about in quantum theory. And what's, what's remarkable is that despite you know, the, these conferences in the 1920s, nothing has actually really moved on in, in quantum mechanics. It, it's, um, you know, the, the fundamental understanding, obviously we're much, much better at predicting. We can do the um, uh, numerical um, integration much faster and we can make very good predictions quantum mechanically, but the philosophy hasn't really moved on a, a great deal. And um, as I say, I mean, if, you, if you're the person who can solve that, then you know, there's, there's a Nobel Prize in it there, I'm sure. Did you say you wanted a question? Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I would like to ask a question about the philosophical dimension of the unpredictability of nature um, for instance, um, 
we know that nature sometimes is very unpredictable, especially ecologically now. Where is the place of human freedom? And there is a place of human freedom because we know that human freedom have impact on nature. But where is God um, in line with, um, in a way, controlling the situation of nature when well, it gets better or bad? That's a very big philosophical, theological question. Um, I mean, there are different. One of the big problems is the problem of evil if we're in nature, uh, and and within mankind. And um, one of the uh, there are various different approaches to 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 nature. But one of the one of the approaches is that um, there is what's known as a, a free will defense, as it were, and a free process defense. Which, effective free will defense, is that God creates human beings to be genuinely free to make their own choices. And so therefore, if one human being is evil to another human being, or you know, you get Hitler or whoever else, the genocide is, is created, then that's a product of the fact that he has created us genuinely free. There's also an equivalent for natural processes, the free process defense, which is that, you know, that, that there can sometimes be awful volcanoes erupting and um, earthquakes and, and so on, because although he sustains the laws of nature and being, he doesn't interfere with their operation. Now, that's, but that's, I mean, again, that, that's, that, 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 well, that creates the, I mean, that is a big theological issue, you know, to what extent, why does it that God doesn't intervene to prevent earthquakes and, and so on? But, I mean, this is, these are major, major issues about um, the extent to which evil, it, there is evil in the world generally and, and, and sort of belief in God. I mean, they're very fundamental questions in theology. So, I mean, they're not really divine action questions, they're more fundamental questions for, for, for theology generally. I think probably maybe, I'm sorry, just the, I don't think that God doesn't want to intervene because he doesn't love human beings. I think maybe it's, nature is doing its cause and God may take something better from out of that, he may use it for something better that we don't understand. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think. One of, no human being could hope to understand the purpose behind creation and everything else. Um, you know, and it may be that we suffer sometimes. I think C.S. Lewis wrote a lot about this, about suffering and the, trying to rationalise suffering. But but it's you know it, it's it's a um, it's a very you know they are fundamentally difficult questions. Why should you suffer as an individual? Is there something to be gained for society as a whole or for creation as a whole through your suffering? Um, Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for your talk. When you were uh, categorizing the different types of laws, mm. you uh, did regularity, instrumentalist, necessitarian. Yep. There's lots of different ways that you could spell out a necess uh, necessitarian, necessitarian yes. approach. And I was just wondering whether you thought that some ways of spelling it out would be more useful if you wanted to have God interacting in the world than others. Uh, some are tighter than others. I think I, I'm not. It depends. I mean, certainly there are there are sort of structural necessity approaches. There are kind of logical necessity approaches. Um, structural necessity approaches tend to be because of relations between particular things that happen in a particular way. And so the assumption is that if they're continually happening in that way, then ontologically, that's how nature's as it were built up. Those are the Lego bricks that build up nature, and that's how they connect together. Um, so I mean, th those approaches are obviously much less easy to square with divine action unless you have some flexibility in the way that they, they operate. But yes, no, I mean, it is, I'm afraid this was a very crude, crude little summary about, you know, many, many tomes of work on the philosophy of the laws of nature. And, and there are many different versions of, of the Sestarian approaches. I guess sort of what I'm trying to ask as well is on, on some necessar necessitarian approaches, like things are inactive and laws act on things. Yeah. And on others, things are active. And they have the capacity to act. A bit like Cartwright's view. Yeah. Um, and it's quite popular today in metaphysics. Like there's a view called realist lawlessness by mm. Stephen Mumford. So he yeah. thinks there's connections. But he wants to take Hume's view that it's more, there's no laws. Laws is a bad yeah. metaphor, basically. Yeah. Um, well, laws are just describing the connections that you yeah. see happen as opposed to actually describing the connections. That's yeah. That's, I mean, no. I mean, there are, as I say, that I think this is this is an area where, again, 
not, there hasn't been much unpacking of, of looking at the different approaches to laws of nature from the perspective of, of theology, and, and I mean, not only the theology, theological consequences of them, but also, you know, it's, I think it's quite important to try and identify people and, and just sort of, you know, at this point they're wearing a, this type of necessitarian hat, and at this point they're, they're being a sneaky regulatarian because it suits them for this argument and, and so on. So, I mean, it's just a... Uh, as I, say, I think there, there's a, a very large amount of work that could be done there. It's, it's a you know, much quite an interesting area to work, but it, it does at least. It's quite important to sort of try. I mean, I'm not suggesting everyone needs to be categorised for the sake of categorising them, but it is important because every now and then there's a certain amount of philosophical sleight of hand that goes on in, in theology, believe it or not. Um, and um, if, if you're clear about where you're starting, then at least you can see when the sleight of hands are, are, are happening. But no, I mean, Nancy's approach to, um, to, to laws of nature is certainly something I think generally is, is a sort of very fruitful area to, to look at generally for divine action. Uh, thank you very much for laying out the state of the field so thoroughly. Um, I have two interrelated questions. Um, I, I suppose a skeptic might look at this project and say that essentially it's still a God of the Gaps type project mm. in that it's scaring the frontiers of science to find some kind of place where there's some at, at present indeterminacy or what looks like indeterminacy where we can then kind of drop in and say that might be where divine action is happening. Um, and so a second part, uh, and how would you respond to that? A second part to the question would be, I suppose then the holy grail for a special divine action project would be some domain uh, which is for some a priori reason ontologically inexplicable by science and therefore... Well, and yes, but then you've got a really big gap. Sure. <laughs> so, and, and I mean, that's the, the, the thing about the, uh, the Bonhoeffer um, God of the Gaps arguments, they, I mean, uh, I, a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to pretend this is not really a God of the Gaps exercise, but it is, uh, and actually everybody is doing it to a certain extent. Um, because if, again, you're assuming that you're approaching things as a necessitarian and you're making assumptions about determinism, and as I say, if you're thinking about determinism, you must see this Ehrman book, because not all systems that you'd assume are deterministic are actually deterministic. Um, but again, if you're making those philosophical assumptions, then you've effectively boxed yourself out from divine action in, for those particular theories. Um, uh, and so therefore you're, you're looking for something outside those theories. Now, whether you're calling it a gap is an unattractive word, but you're looking for either uh, taking the most sort of the, um, the, the different approaches at the end, you're either looking for a patchwork of natural laws, um, sort of follow, picking up on this Nancy Cartwright type approach, or you're looking for laws with limited applicability, so they have limited scope, or you're um, saying that there are laws that have, um, uh, that, that there can be whole part causation or some kind of supervenience in laws and so on. And these are all different approaches for, for finding ways in which our description of nature is in some sense incomplete. So this is, yeah, I mean, I'm afraid that there is an, it is, it's a fair criticism, but it's one that is quite difficult actually to, to, to make go away. Um, so I, think, I mean, it's better just to be upfront about it, I think. Well, in fact, Thomas Tracy says it is a god of the gaps and that's fine. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I think yeah. you, you you shouldn't try and you know. I mean, it, it, there is a it, there, there are gaps and gaps, as it were. But yeah. you know, obviously, saying everything is obviously turning on the Copenhagen approach to quantum mechanics, that would be a rather foolish thing to do because in who knows, in fifty years' time, someone may come along and say, well, actually, all along it was the fact that you were doing Fourier transforms and you never should have done this. You should have had the following type of mathematics, and the whole thing falls away, and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle goes, and everything else follows with it. Now, you know, that would be obviously rather embarrassing for, for theology, but I don't think theology needs to be scared of that. I mean, one, one of the things that, um, you know, as theologians, there's, there's a presumption that theology has to get it right first time. And, you know, we're not dealing with that kind of, that kind of subject. What we're trying to do is understand more about theology as a description of nature in the same way that we have science describing nature. And, and you know, we, we shouldn't, shouldn't be worried about the fact that as, as time goes on, we learn other things, and, and that as you do that, you learn as a theologian in the same way that you learn as a, as a physicist. I mean, it's, you know, this is, it's, it would be very depressing if, if, if we got it right, everything right first time. I mean, it's a big different, difference between philosophical theology and, and revelation, as it were. Well, I have two questions, if I may. Yeah, of course, yeah. 
Um, I'm always slightly anxious with a PhD on divine action. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your work was very useful for mine, so okay. thank you. Oh, sorry, very good. <laughs> um, so, following on these comments that you've just made, uh, so what would you say to Bob Russell or Tom Tracy who say, yeah, that's fine, if you think in 50 years science changes, we start all over again? Mm. Um, so that's one question, right? Because they say, yeah, we right. pick the... Copenhagen interpretation, yeah. and we know it is an I, interpretation, and that's I don't, fine. I don't have a major problem with that. In the sense, I don't, as I say, I think very much of the view that um, you know, for theology, for for these theological issues to be uh, a, a mature discussion, it is important that you realise the the limits of the of the science and theology project as well. I mean, it, we are trying to relate things that we don't understand properly with other things that we don't understand properly. <laughs> uh, you know, so, don't, you know, we shouldn't hide away from that. I mean, it, it, so as you, and as your knowledge develops in one particular area, then, then you know, it may lead you to, to change your views on things. And that's, that's, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we've got it wrong. It just means that we're, we're learning. But, you know, theologians, I think, should be open to doing that. So, but yes, you know, good on Bob and, and, and Thomas Tracy. Uh, uh, and the second one, um, you spoke lots of uh, John Paulton and his uh, active information um, exercise, but then later on he moved on uh, and uh, speaking about kenosis, he spoke of energetic input mm. from God. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, not so much. I mean, unless he's moved on well, know, in the last um, couple of years. But in, in, his, in the book, um, The Work of Love, he edited it. Okay. He speaks of uh, energetic yeah, okay. uh, input, so both right. uh, information input, but as well energetic yeah. input. And that's because of his considerations of Maltman's ideas on kenosis. Yeah. Um, well, my question was, what do you make of it? But perhaps you're not I, that I, familiar yeah, in it. So. I'm afraid I, can't, I probably yeah, can't, fair enough. <laughs> can't take that much further. But no, I mean, it sounds very interesting. Yeah. Right. right. Um, one more question over there. Um, it occurred to me that, at least in your presentation, um, that the mode of causation was primarily efficient in the different models that you mm. discussed. Um, and I wonder whether there isn't good reason to look at some other kinds of causation. Uh, one in particular that is interesting me uh, for other reasons is something that I found that's called specificative extrinsic formal causation. Um, well, horrible terminology. Yes, yeah. It's a sort of a late Latin age thing, and it emerged from the uh, from the discussion on interpretation and sign action. But the funny thing about it is that it can apply equally to mind independent situations. Okay. Um, it basically takes uh, basically takes something along the lines of I wouldn't be able to interpret that as that table as a giraffe, um, given my uh, the, my sensory apparatus. Um, and so what the table is doing in its own nature is uh, specifying external, externally to my process the, uh, the form of the process. Um, and it doesn't do so efficiently, it does so formally, it's not necessarily energetic input, um, it's not necessarily informational either. Um, I'm not quite sure how to characterize it in those okay. terms. But it might be quite useful when no, you think of God very as a yeah. as I mean, a I'm afraid I don't know anything being. about it at all. But it sounds yeah, it sounds very interesting. I mean, certainly the causation uh, causation is a huge problem in in philosophy of science generally, and you know, the, not least causation, mind body causation, and everything. I mean, how do human beings act in the world, and how do how does causation occur? So, I mean, there are a whole host of there's a lot of philosophical literature literature around that, but I haven't haven't come across that approach before. So, no, it's, it's very interesting. Good. Well, thank you very much, Nick. Sorry, that was fantastic. No, no, no problem at all. Uh, very, very good. And uh, before we thank Nick, um, let me invite you and remind you about two weeks' time, Professor Hal Hans Halverson from Princeton will come to speak about Does the Universe Need God? Uh, so you're very welcome. It's not going to be in this room. It's going to be in Trinity College. It's in the dance room room, which is behind, next to the library. I'm sure you can find your ways. Uh, but now, please, do join me to thank... Uh, Nick Fries, fantastic.